Good morning, and we welcome you to our Bible class hour this morning. We see several visiting with us from out of town, some visiting with us from the community. We are very glad that you're here. A word of explanation is in order that this is the uh, first session of our annual Victory Lectures. These were all scheduled the last week of October, had to do with the School of Preaching and uh, the church here, and we look forward to a very good week of excellent lectures. If you're unfamiliar with what that is, then we have our regular times today, and then each evening, Monday through Thursday, we'll meet at 6.30 for singing and 7 o'clock for worship and a good lesson. And then all day, if you happen to be off work or can get off work, all day, Monday through Thursday, we'll have lessons, six lessons during the day. And there's schedules in the back on the foyer if you would like to avail yourself of one of those. This time, we'll have uh, Steve Prayer, Steve Prayer, <laughs> Steve Har, come lead us in a prayer, and then uh, after that, I'll introduce our speaker this morning. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Father, we are so thankful for you. We're thankful for all you've given us. We're thankful for this time that we could come here and study your word. Father, we are so thankful that we have your word, that we can read it, and that we can understand it, and that we can apply it to our lives, and know how to become Christians, and how to become stronger Christians. Father, we pray that you be with us as we study this morning. Help us to take the cares of the world out of, out of our mind and focus on your word this morning. Please be with Seth as he brings us a message. We pray that you be with all the teachers this morning as, as they present their message, that they would have a remembrance of, of your word, that they can present it to others in a clear way that people can understand it. Father, we are so thankful for you. We're thankful for your son, Jesus, and it's in his name we pray. Amen. Most of you know our first speaker this morning when our lectureship committee met and we're going over different uh, lessons that we would like presented by different preachers in the area and some from out of the area. The lectureship committee knew that Seth McIntyre, one of our elders, was a very good student of scriptures and particularly of Old Testament scriptures and they wanted him to be able to do the Bible class hour this morning. I think it's an excellent decision and we're glad that Seth was willing to do that. He was the very first one to turn in a manuscript for the book and he was on the ball and we appreciate that very much. For the sake of those who may not know Seth and for the sake of those who might be viewing on the web, I would like to introduce Seth formally. Seth McIntyre is a lifelong resident of Marshall County, West Virginia. He is a graduate of West Liberty State College, which is now West Liberty University. Seth is a certified public accountant, a certified management accountant, and finance director for the city of Wheeling, West Virginia. He and his wife, Michelle, formerly Michelle Fogel, have four daughters, Kathleen with her husband, Jason Johnson, Heather, Brenna, and Riley, and two grandchildren, Lindy and Jason. They're members of the Hillview Terrace Church of Christ here in Moundsville, where Seth serves as an elder. The theme for this week is the Psalms, but there is a great Psalm that is not in the book of Psalms, as there are several other places in the Old Testament. One of them in 1 Samuel chapter 2, dealing with Hannah's song, after Hannah's prayer, after she, um, after she was able to conceive with her child Samuel after much request. Seth is going to be leading with that this morning because it fits in the overall theme, even though it's not from the book of Psalms. Seth? <coughs> Thank you, Brother Andy. I would invite you to open your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 2 as we look at this great prayer offered by Hannah. We won't spend a lot of time on the background or the history uh, associated with this prayer. Andy has uh, already pointed out uh, that uh, she had made a request, Hannah had made a request of God to grant her a child. And had promised that if she would do that, if she would give, if he would do that rather, if he would give her a son, she would give that son to him, to the Lord. Uh, she had, to that point, been barren, uh, and so uh, and had endured some scorn and uh, other uh, difficulties. 
associated with that, or related to that, but God had granted her request. And uh, he kept his uh, word, he gave her that, and she kept her part of the uh, request in giving that son to the Lord. And so in chapter 2, beginning in verse 1, she offers this prayer to God. How we approach God in worship and in prayer is a reflection, really, of our estimation of God, how we esteem Him. Are worship and prayer joys to us, or are they burdens? A study of the Psalms of the Scripture, the inspired Psalms of Holy Scripture, will certainly help us to elevate God to His proper station uh, and to keep Him there. And a study of this psalm, particularly this morning, uh, will go a long way, I believe, in accomplishing uh, good things for us in terms of our prayer lives and in terms of our worship. Uh, for this study, we have divided this psalm into seven uh, three-line stanzas, I have called them. That may not be the, uh, the proper word. But each of those uh, stanzas illuminates a concept that ought to influence the nature of our prayers and the nature of the worship that we offer to God. Three of those uh, concepts that we'll notice this morning address our attitudes specifically. And the other four address truths about God that ought to frame our attitudes. And notice as we go through this, and we're going to go rather quickly, there's a lot of material uh, that we won't have time to cover, in fact. Uh, we could spend a lot of time in this psalm, uh, much more time than we have this morning. But notice as we go through it, this, this theme uh, that, uh, that is woven through it, that runs through it, of God's bringing low and lifting up. Notice the exhortation and the admonition that are in it. Notice the chastening and the strengthening that are in it. Notice the references in it to poverty and oppression set against uh, the references that are there to wealth and victory. Notice the, uh, the, the uh, parts of the prayer that address pride and arrogance. Uh, and notice the parts that address humility and submission to God. And so the bringing low of those who trust in their own might uh, and the lifting up of those who trust in the might of the Almighty God. My heart rejoiceth in the Lord. Mine horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth is enlarged over mine enemies because I rejoice in thy salvation. And so the first item that we we'll want to notice here is Hannah's rejoicing. The words that she offers here are notably, I think, uh, not only beautiful, but simple. Profound in their simplicity, one might say. There is no fanfare, there is no overabundance of speech, there is no flattering, flowery language. You know, oftentimes we see people in the presence of worldly dignitaries um, overflow with words in an attempt to make an impression on those dignitaries. We don't see any of that here from Hannah as she approaches the God of heaven. She, she expresses the simple truth of a grateful and humble heart. And what she says here, the words that, with which she begins this prayer, uh, certainly ring, I think, with emotion. And yet do not uh, outpace themselves with an expression or uh, overflow of emotionalism. And that's something that we need to be careful about. We need to uh, be cognizant, cognizant of and to express properly rejoicing for God and what He has done for us. Uh, and yet we need to be careful about getting too carried away in emotion or by emotion. When thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, Jesus said, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. And when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father which seest in secret, or which is in secret. And thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly, Matthew 5, or 6 rather, beginning in verse 5. Think of the words of the prophet Habakkuk as he 
spoke against the idols that m men were creating, had created, wood and stone, and the vanity of those idols. He reminded the people in chapter 2 and verse 20 about the true and the living God. Th think about the, uh, the, uh, the emotionalism, really, that was associated with the worship of these idols. Think about the children of Israel at the foot of Mount Sinai and how they behaved down there. Think about the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel and how they behaved. And think about this statement from Habakkuk with regard to the true and the living God. The God who doesn't need anything from men. The God whose existence does not depend upon men. The God uh, that men did not create, do not, uh, does not sustain, and cannot destroy. The prophet says, But the Lord is in His holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before Him. How much more reverent, uh, ought reverent silence then to characterize the assembly of the church, the true temple of the living God? 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 16. We need to maintain a proper decorum in the assembly. All things need to be done decently and in order, as the Scriptures point out. And yet, it, our prayers and our worship ought to be characterized and ought to involve and ought to, uh, we ought to keep in mind the rejoicing that we ought to express to the God who has done everything for us, who has given us everything, who uh, gives us everything, and again, who has done everything for us. There is none holy as the Lord. For there is none beside thee, neither is there any rock like our God. Notice this secondly then, in conjunction with, or in association with, or in addition to, the rejoicing that Hannah expresses, the reverence that she uh, uh, demonstrates here. There is none as holy as the Lord. There is none beside thee. Neither is there any rock like our God. God expects and commands His people to be holy, as and because He is holy. Leviticus, rather, chapter 11, verse 44, 1 Peter 1, 15, 16. And so our prayers and our worship ought to be founded uh, on a realization and an acknowledgement of the supreme and sublime holiness of God. Any holiness, really, that we might achieve, that we might attain, is is a child's imitation, I suppose you might say, at the end of the day, of God's holiness. The holiness of Him whose ways and whose thoughts are so much higher than our ways and our thoughts, as the heavens are higher than the earth, He said through Isaiah in 55 and verse 9. And so to remember the holiness of God and to uh, keep that in mind, in all that we do, uh, including when we pray and as we worship, is, is to re render to God the awe and the reverence and the respect that is due it. And it involves striving to perfect holiness in the fear of God, 2 Corinthians 7 and 1. Stand in awe, the psalmist wrote, and sin not. Commune with your own heart upon your bed, and be still. Psalm 4 and verse 4. Let all the earth fear the Lord, and let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of Him. Psalm 33 and verse 8. And uh, the preacher wrote at the end of his book in chapter 12 and verse 13 of Ecclesiastes, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. And so, reverence before God ought to characterize our prayers and our worship. Keep thy foot when thou goest to the house of God, and be more ready to hear than to give the sacrifice of fools, for they consider not that they do evil. Be not rash with thy mouth, and let not thine heart be hasty to utter anything before God. For God is in heaven, and thou upon earth, therefore... Let thy words be few. Ecclesiastes 5, verses 1 and 2. Thirdly, 
we want to notice the attitude of humility. We've talked about rejoicing, we've talked about reverence, and now notice the humility that is indicated here. Talk no more so exceeding proudly. Let not arrogancy come out of your mouth, for the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by Him actions are weighed. Here, I think, really, we begin to see the, uh, the meat, so to speak, of this theme of bringing low and lifting up. God casts the haughty down and exalts the humble. That, those are uh, themes that are woven throughout Scripture. The proud are brought low, Job 40 and verse 12, Proverbs 29 and verse 23. Those who dwell on high are brought down, Isaiah 26 and verse 5. Pride and haughtiness are the precursors of destruction and downfall, uh, the Proverbs writer said in 16 and verse 18. And so humility ought to characterize our prayers and our worship to God and everything else that we do for that matter. We need to be careful what we say. Notice here he says, talk no, she says, talk no more so exceeding proudly. Let not arrogancy come out of your mouth. You know, speech is an indicator of the condition of the heart. And our desire and goal ought to be a pure heart. And so we should be taking regular readings of, if you want to look at it in these terms, the speech gauge. Uh, in Matthew chapter 15 and verse 18, we're reminded by the Lord that those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart. And so we need to be listening to what we are saying and be careful about that. When it comes to God and the things of God, we don't know any more than God has revealed to us. And there are secret things, of course, Deuteronomy 29 and verse 29, that God has not revealed to us, that belong to Him and to Him alone. And so it's a mark of haughtiness to be always declaring and never asking, particularly when we're talking to God, when we're approaching God in prayer. It's arrogance to so position ourselves and to so cultivate our hearts that our communication with God is all declaration and all demand and all rehearsal and doesn't involve any praise, any genuine thanksgiving, or any humble petition. We need to be careful about that. When we approach God, uh, some, someone said this at some point in time, and I don't know who and I don't know when, I just know I heard it. Uh, but someone posed a question like this. Uh, are we seeking to talk with God or are we giving God a talking to? We need to be careful about that. Remember the Pharisee who stood and prayed thus with himself. God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. Remember the publican to whom this Pharisee made reference. The publican who, standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Remember which of those two men went down to his house justified. Luke chapter 18, beginning in verse 11. God is perfect in knowledge. God is perfect in judgment. And so there's no word spoken... There is no action performed. There is no work undertaken. There is no invention imagined, but that God knows the thought and the intent of the heart behind it. Hebrews 4 and verse 12. And so, proud talk and arrogant speech are foolishness and vanity. Those few verses then... Uh, encapsulate the three attitudes that we mentioned at the outset uh, that uh, we need to consider and that we need to think about, that we need to bear in mind and that we need to strive uh, to, uh, to exercise and evidence. Rejoicing in our prayers, in our worship. Reverence in our prayers, in our worship. And humility in our prayers and in our worship. I think you'll find 
uh, as we go through these studies in Psalms this week, those themes coming up again and again and again and again uh, as we strive to, uh, to learn more about the Word of God and applying it to prayer, our prayers and our worship. The next four things that we want to notice then deal with characteristics of God that do certainly uh, frame our attitudes toward God. The bows of the mighty men are broken, and they that stumbled are girded with strength. They that were full have hired out themselves for bread, and they that were hungry ceased, so that the barren hath borne seven, and she that hath many children is waxed feeble. Notice again the up and down, the uh, bringing low and the lifting up involved just in these few lines. As we perhaps alluded to already, God looks upon the heart, 1 Samuel 16 and verse 7. doesn't look on the outward appearance of man, as men do. doesn't look on the beauty of a face or the height of a man's stature. But He looks upon the heart. And it is those whose hearts are corrupted, really, by the pride and the arrogance that has just been spoken about and warned against in this prayer. Those who trust in and honor and praise themselves and who glory in self-assessment of what they've attained that fall into condemnation. Those who, without thought for God, attribute uh, the blessings of God, improperly attribute the blessings of God, I might add, to their own wisdom and to their own power, and who use the blessings that God has given them to oppress the weak and the afflicted, it is to those that the corrective rod of God's judgment and justice is applied. Conversely, notice here, it's the weak, it's the oppressed and the afflicted that God lifts up. You know, God has always demonstrated tenderness. God has always demonstrated mercy. God has always demonstrated justice. And He has always demanded that of man. That to the extent of our God-given capacity and ability, we do the very same thing. Learn to do well. Seek judgment. Relieve the oppressed. Judge the fatherless. Plead for the widow. Isaiah 1 and verse 17. All of the things that we just noted are involved in that kind of behavior. And certainly God's justice is displayed and uh, evidenced in, in that kind of behavior. He has showed thee, O man, what is good. And what doth the Lord require of thee? But what? To do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. Three things. Three simple things. Just a few words there. Not always easy. We need to give ourselves to the pursuit of those things. That's Micah chapter 6 and verse 8. And so the justice of God ought to frame our attitude as we approach God in prayer and as we, as we offer our worship to God. God's justice. Next, the Lord killeth and maketh alive. He bringeth down to the grave and bringeth up. The Lord maketh poor, and maketh rich. He bringeth low, and lifteth up. He raiseth up the poor out of the dust, and lifteth up the beggar from the dunghill, to set them among princes, and to make them inherit the throne of glory. The magnificence of these lines, I think, cannot be overstated. We want to notice the concept of and the characteristic of God's redemption as we think about these lines, these verses. God's abasing the, the high and exalting the low has, has been well established and is well established in Scripture with regard to God's care for the oppressed, uh, for the righteous. 
for those oppressed by the wicked. I found as I was preparing the manuscript for this and preparing for this lesson a quote that I thought was interesting by a man uh, that I don't know anything else about except that I read some of his material, uh, whose last name is Smith. And he made this remark uh, that one he, that he called an ancient philosopher, and he didn't say who that was, but he said, one ancient philosopher went so far as to say, God does nothing else but humble the proud and exalt the lowly. Think about that. That's, uh, that's an interesting statement and comment to think about and to think upon. In all that God does, this ancient philosopher said, there is some element of humbling the proud and or exalting the lowly. It has been demonstrated that no one is so high that he can withstand or so low that he cannot be elevated by God's justice. And yet, we tend to think about, we tend, I think, oftentimes to read about and study about and consequently to think about these things in physical terms. We, uh, the physical is something we think we know something we see, something we live with and deal with every day. And certainly there, are, there are, uh, were physical applications to these things. Hannah literally bore a son. That is a physical blessing that manifested. Uh, and that's one of hundreds of examples, no doubt. And yet, there is something beyond the physical. There is something more important. There is something greater. There is the spiritual to consider. And we need to think about things in spiritual terms. Look then at this stanza in that light, in the light of a broader, more substantial, more consequential, more important application. And think about the poor man who is not simply raised out of the dust. That would be enough, I would think, for many who are afflicted. Just give me a little relief. Give me a little bit of help. But God doesn't, does not simply raise up out of the dust the poor man here. He exalts him to a place among princes. The beggar is not just simply lifted up out of the dunghill, but he is made an heir of the throne of glory. God brings low and lifts up the abundance, the excess, we might think, with which, with which and by which God blesses His people. There is reference after reference, really, to it in the Scripture. Sometimes we lose sight of it. We need to be mindful of God's abundance. God does not bring the proud one low just simply for the sake of bringing him low. God has all power. God has all might. God is the Almighty. And if He wants to bring a man low, just simply to do that, I suppose He can. But does He? Does His justice, does His goodness, does His mercy, does His love, does His righteousness uh, permit Him to do that? Does he, is that characteristic of God? I don't think it is. He does not bring one low simply for the sake of bringing him low. He doesn't do it simply to assert his own supremacy or to satisfy his own ego. That's not our God. And although he oftentimes does it to provide succor to his people, he does not exclusively and solely do it for that reason. There is always with God a desire for the highest good of man. Even wicked men. God is not willing that any should perish. Who does that leave out? Is there one somewhere in the world that God is willing that that person should perish? God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. 2 Peter 3 and verse 9. In every bringing low then, there exists the seed of exaltation. Who is it who will be lifted up by God? 
lifted up in the sight of God, who is not first and must not first be humbled and abased, brought low in his own eyes. Who is it who is made spiritually alive, who does not first and must not first die to self and sin? Only the power of God can accomplish that. And that power is the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. God brings low and lifts up. When by the gospel of Jesus Christ, we who were dead in sin die to sin, God makes us alive in Christ. That's a bringing low and a lifting up of the highest magnitude. Scripture references, incidentally, to some of these things that I've said are in the manuscript, and I haven't given them all here, but certainly Romans chapter 1 and verse 16 I've referenced. Romans chapter 6, the whole chapter. Romans chapter 8, verse 10. Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 5. Colossians 2.13, 1 Peter 2.24. All of those bear upon these things that we have mentioned here with regard to the redemption of God. And so God both kills and makes alive. He both brings down to the grave and lifts up alive again. What a marvelous knowledge. What a marvelous thought that ought to frame our attitudes and our thinking, our thoughts and our words as we approach God in prayer and as we offer our worship to Him. Through the gospel of Christ, God gently lifts the poor in spirit up out of the dust of hopelessness. And he mercifully lifts the one up who is enslaved by the weak and beggarly elements of the world, as Paul called them in Galatians 4 and verse 9, from the dunghill of sin and death. And he exalts them to the place of princes, to the adoption of sons, Galatians 4, 5, Ephesians 1, 5, to heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, Romans 8 and verse 17, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and He has set the world upon them. He will keep the feet of His saints and the wicked shall be silent in darkness, for by strength shall no man prevail. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. Out of heaven shall he thunder upon them. Notice in these lines, in these verses, the authority of God. We have looked at the justice of God. We have talked about the redemption of God. And now notice the authority of God. The pillars of the earth are the Lord's. God is the author of creation. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein, Psalm 24 and verse 1. God has the power and the right to order it, order it as He sees fit. He has the power to keep His saints and He has the power to judge the wicked. Notice here that in, in that language, in that specific language, the keeping of the feet of His saints and the judgment of the wicked. And the phrase there, for by strength shall no man prevail. That's an interesting phrase to think about. By strength shall no man prevail. That, is that just a reference to the wicked? Or does he mean what he said? Does she mean what she says there? Does the inspired scripture mean what it says there? By strength shall no man prevail. The right, uh, the godless cannot, by their strength, stand against God. Can't be done. Can't overpower. Can't outstrengthen God. But it's also true that the saints, by our own strength, cannot keep ourselves against the wicked cannot deliver ourselves from the wages of sin. Don't we need God's help in that? Can I do it all by myself? No! I can't. I'm going to stumble. I'm going to fall. And then, what? Then I'm going to need help. And so by, by my own strength, I can't prevail. 
By your own strength, you can't prevail. By their own strength, the wicked can't prevail. For the adversary of God, that means he will be broken to pieces. It doesn't say could be. It doesn't say might be. But will be. That's God's judgment. The adversary, the wicked, the contrary, the godless, is going to face condemnation. He's going to face judgment. He's going to face uh, destruction. And that's why it's imperative that the wicked turn from his way and live. Ezekiel chapter 33, Ezekiel chapter 18 as well. Time and time and time and time again, God pleads, turn, turn, turn. Why will you die? It's imperative because destruction has been appointed for the wicked. But for the righteous, God will keep his feet. God will guard his steps. God will protect. God will preserve. God is for us rather than against us. Romans 8, 31. Rather than the silent darkness of, of, uh, that's the, that is the lot of the wicked, we have life and immortality. 2 Timothy 1 and 10. We have fellowship with God and Christ and one another in the light of the gospel. 1 John 1 and verse 7. We have the confidence that, we, that if we ask anything according to His will, He heareth us. 1 John 5 and verse 14. Marvelous, wonderful blessings associated with the authority of God. And so the recognition of those blessings ought to flavor, ought to season, ought to influence how we pray, how we worship, ought to attune us to the appropriate humility and praise and adoration and reverence and gratitude for the unspeakable gift of God's only begotten Son. 2 Corinthians 9 and verse 15. Finally, the Lord shall judge the ends of the earth, and He shall give strength unto His King and exalt the horn of His anointed. And His prayer ends with an affirmation of the certainty and the completeness of God's judgment. And that's the final point that we want to notice here. Judgment. The judgment of God. God's judgment which will be accomplished by the king to whom he gives strength. The anointed, rather, whose horn he exalts. All that has been said here, all that has been said here is summed up, is, well, uh, to borrow a scriptural phrase, briefly comprehended, in Christ and in the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. It is Christ whom God exalted over His enemies. It is Christ whom He lifted up from the dust of rejection and humiliation. It is Christ whom He raised victorious from the grave. It is Christ whom He exalted to be a prince and a savior. It is Christ to whom He gave a throne. And it is Christ by whom He will judge the quick and the dead. I'm not going to go through all of those Scripture references for the sake of time. Again, they're in the manuscript. Uh, as likely as not, you know them already. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God hath also highly exalted him, and hath given him a name which is above every name. Look at that bringing low. Look at that lifting up. That at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Philippians chapter 2 beginning in verse 5. The marvelous redemption of God. The marvelous judgment of God. It is in Christ alone, not in any other, in Christ alone. And it is only in Christ, not outside of Christ, in Christ, that one realizes all the blessings of this psalm and every other spiritual blessing that flows from the throne of God. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Ephesians 1 and verse 3. I would encourage you, I would urge you to take time, make time to study this psalm and other psalms, the other psalms of Scripture. 
And those kinds of studies will lead us to examine and where necessary to correct the propriety, if I may use that word, with which we approach the throne of Almighty God in prayer and in worship. The joy, the reverence, the humility that we express in answer to the holiness and the power and the wisdom and the faithfulness of God that He exercises, or by which He exercises, through which, within which He exercises these things that we have discussed and noticed here this morning. His supreme authority, His flawless judgment, His perfect justice, and His magnificent salvation. We typically do not, in the Bible study hour, extend an invitation, but if you're outside of the body of Christ, you are in danger. You're in a very serious situation. Why don't you get into Christ? Why don't you come to Christ believing that He is the Son of God, repenting of your sin, confessing your faith in Him as the Son of God, and being buried in the waters of baptism for the remission of your sins? Why don't you avail yourself of the great blessings of God, the likes of which are discussed in this psalm and throughout the Scripture, and which are found only in Christ. You have an opportunity to do that, not just at the end of a worship service, but any time that you are ready to obey the gospel. While you let yet live, you have the opportunity. If you need to do it, why don't you make that known before it's too late? If you need to be restored to God's fold of safety, why don't you make that known before it's too late? Thank you very much. We appreciate that very good lesson from Seth. It's got us off to a good start for our lectures. And I'll reiterate that if there's anyone who has some questions about the plan of salvation or would like to discuss that more, find us anytime during the week. We would love to talk with you. We'd love nothing more than to talk with you about that. We appreciate Seth's study. We appreciate his willingness to kick off this lectureship with that good insight into Hannah's prayer. We'll stand dismissed at this time until our worship hour.